All right, so for those of you who are new, uh, we are wrapping up a series today we've been in the last six weeks called How Are You Doing Really? And the tagline of the series is Finding Hope for Mental Health. So we've talked about what God has to say about things like anxiety, depression, burnout, suicide. Uh, we've tackled a lot of difficult subjects. And the thing I've said uh, over and over throughout the series is, uh, first of all, I'm not equipped to give you everything that you need to know as you're navigating through this. Uh, there's a spiritual component to this that I can address, but there are other components to this as well. So this is just a piece of it. And I've encouraged you, you know, if you need to go see a doctor, go see a doctor. That's awesome. If they can give you medicine to help, that's wonderful. If you need to go see a counselor, see a counselor. By all means, have a few people in your life that you trust enough. You'll open up and share with them what's going on inside of you. That's so important because no one is designed to walk through this alone. And we certainly do not want that to be the case here. We want to normalize this conversation where you feel like you can walk in here. There's no shame. There's no guilt. Nobody's looking down on you if you say, hey, I struggle with this or I struggle with this. That's perfectly fine because we just don't want you to feel like you got to walk through any of this alone. Uh, so I was thinking about how do I wrap this up today? We've dealt with some really tough subjects. And I was thinking, how am I going to do this on Mother's Day? Um, and as I told uh, some of y'all a couple weeks ago, ladies, I thought the very best most loving thing I could do for you on Mother's Day is get off the stage and not give you a sermon. So you're welcome. Not going to do that. Clearly word got out. It's packed in here today. So thanks, guys. It's really good for the self-esteem. Just kidding. So, no, I'm so glad you're here today because in a minute, uh, I'm going to bring out Jen Johnson and Chelsea Gilbert. I thought the best way to end this is to talk about what it looks like when mental health and our families intersect. Um, what we can do for ourselves what we can do for our loved ones, uh, what to look for to know if somebody is struggling. So no matter uh, who you are, if you're a parent or not a parent, it doesn't matter. If you're a sibling, if you, you know, you, all of us are going to be able to walk away with something helpful today. Uh, so Jen's going to come out. Jen is our director of family ministries here. She oversees everything that happens on that side of the building. Uh, the harder job she has is she's also my wife, so I hate that for her, but she said yes, so it's her fault. Um, so so she'll be out in a minute. She's going to have a conversation with Chelsea Gilbert. Uh, a lot of you may know uh, Chelsea is Miss Gilbert. Uh, she was a longtime school counselor at Calway Middle School. She now moved over to Southwest Elementary because they couldn't get my son in line. So they sent her over to, I'm just kidding, don't tell him I said that. But uh, she has years of experience doing this. And as somebody we go to a lot, um, I told you I've, I have leaned on so many mental health professionals in our church to help me navigate this series and she's one of them who's been very helpful and very encouraging and I thought what better way to end than to let you hear from two moms who you know you moms work all the time why not on Mother's Day I thought put them to work let them share a little bit with you and uh, you can get a little bit of insight so if you will give a big welcome with me to Jen and Chelsea they'll come share with you Man, you weren't lying. Like, they did decide to pack in today. That's kind of fun. It's a good time. Um, so I am Jen, and as Matt just said, I am the Director of Family Ministries here at Journey. And so I really do get to spend, like, all of my time kind of trying to think about and program and come up with strategies and systems that are going to help your family to build a faith that lasts a lifetime. Because if there's one thing I know, it's that if we had the opportunity, we would all probably be tempted to provide our children with a pain-free, problem-free life. Like that is the thing that we wish we could do. But unfortunately, that's just not reality. That is not the world that we live in. And so the best thing that we can give our kids is to be able to give them a faith that will see them through whenever there are problems and whenever there are painful seasons in life. And so that is what we are trying to do here at Journey over in our family ministries. Now, Chelsea is extra special to me because while I do actually seek her counsel quite regularly as a professional, and I'm always like, is this okay? Is my kid normal? Like, or is this a bad thing? What's going on? Um, she also happens to be just a very, very dear friend. So that is something that makes her extra special to me as well. Now, Chelsea, we are both obviously moms as well. I have a 12-year-old and an almost 11-year-old. And you have how many kids? Four. Four kids. She really decided to be the overachiever uh, is what she was going for. So uh, what ages are your kids? So I have three daughters. Um, my oldest daughter is 12 almost 13 in a few days. Um, my middle daughter is 10, my youngest daughter is 7, and my son is 3. Oh, and they're all so sweet. 
Most of the time. time. I was going to yeah. say, they're all so sweet. <laughs> they're I wonderful. I absolutely love it. Absolutely. Um, so today, Chelsea is going to be talking to us as both a professional and a mom. And then I'll probably throw in a couple of two cents every once in a while, too, just to keep it fun and to keep it interesting, right? So Matt has been spending the past couple of weeks talking to us through this mental health series. He's been addressing different mental health challenges. Um, but I think that when it comes to parenting, like there are some unique things that we face because the reality is parenting is hard hard, like period. You don't have to add anything to it in order for it to be challenging a lot of the times. It is one of the most exhausting and rewarding things that we are ever going to have to do. But sometimes parents will have, in addition to just the regular old hard part of being a parent, they may also have some mental health challenges. And that can add an extra layer of complexity that can just be extra difficult to be able to try and navigate. And so I know that for myself, um, as a mom, there are a lot of times where I feel really guilty Um, taking time for myself, prioritizing myself, wanting to do like something for myself, like those things can feel hard already. So I think a great first question for us to start on is just let's start by talking about why it is important for us as parents to prioritize our mental health because it feels kind of counterintuitive. It doesn't feel like that should be something we do. And it's very normal for that to to make you feel guilty. Um, But you have to think about like when you're on a plane and they say put your oxygen mask on first, We have to be taking care of ourselves and our mental health because our kids are watching us. Um, They're they're watching us and how we're taking care of ourselves. Um, And also, when we have a challenge, um, how do we deal with that challenge? Because the truth is, our kids are going to experience problems. And they're going to look to us to know how to navigate that. And you don't want to see your child in pain. Um, You don't want to see them not know what to do whenever they have a mental health challenge like anxiety or depression. Um, And they're going to look to you to see how you've navigated that or how you deal whenever you do make a mistake. Absolutely. So kind of the big things that I'm hearing you say as to why this really does matter so much is that, number one, um, our children, our students, they are going to be watching us to see how to then interact with their own emotions Mm -hmm. and how to then be able to prioritize themselves and to know how to handle different things or to manage different emotions and Mm -hmm. all of that. And that's really important because I think that as parents, my biggest temptation is that I want to talk about it. Like I have no problem being like, hey, we need to talk about our feelings and practice this and maybe do this. But my children are going to learn significantly more by what they see than by what I say. Like that is what actually teaches our children. So in order to love them well, like they need to see how they are supposed to handle something. But then number two, you can't be the parent that God created you to be, the best parent that you can possibly be if you aren't taking care of yourself because you are not going to be able to provide the level of care and intentionality that maybe you otherwise need. So I think that those are two really important reasons for why it really does matter that we take time to take care of ourselves. Like that really is a big deal. So what tips then would you give to parents to help them kind of start making time or figuring out what it looks like to take care of their mental health? To take care of the parents. So um, it's really just taking that time for yourself Um, And I'm not talking about, like, lots of time. It can be five minutes a day. Um, It may be physical activity. It may be what you're putting in your body. Um, It may be just allowing yourself to take an extra five-minute long shower with your favorite body wash. That's mom's. Yeah. Um, But just doing those things. um, I talk to kids a lot about coping skills or coping mechanisms and make sure they get an idea of what that is because it sounds really complicated, but it's really not. It's really just something that is going to make you feel good and that's not going to harm your body um, if it's a positive coping skill. So just making sure you know and you've kind of been curious with yourself and you know those things that whenever you're feeling a little off or like you're needing some time, that you take the time to do that. And even better if you take the time to do that on a regular basis. Absolutely. So I think, too, like one of the things that can be a little bit tricky for me as a parent um, is that I love my kids so much. Like sometimes they drive me crazy, but I love my kids so much. And I just want to be perfect for them, you know. And I feel like that is one of those struggles that I hear a lot from grownups is just like I'm just always trying to like show them like the best that I can possibly be and the perfect self. But the reality is like 
We all mess up. You know, mm -hmm. like if you guys didn't know this, like just this weekend, I blew up at my kids. It happens to everybody. It is part of the parenting and something that we talk about a lot with our families that are in preschool and um, when we do our child dedication event is we say like you need to be a present parent, not be a perfect parent. Mm -hmm. Our kids actually need to see us struggle, mess up, make a mistake, and then mm -hmm. rebound from that, repair from that, and mm -hmm. do that. So... How does it look for a parent to mess up, blow it, totally not handle the situation mm -hmm. or the moment well, and then be able to come back and turn that into a positive? Mm -hmm. So when you were saying that, that's what I was thinking. It's just as important for our kids to be seeing us doing things right as it is for them to see us whenever we don't handle something as well and how we make amends to that. So the example that you gave of, of blowing up at your kids, I don't know. Like if, say, your kids spilled something on the floor – and you just lashed out. Um, a lot of times, like, we'll have that moment. I might yell. And then I might walk away and think about it and go, you know what? That really, I really wasn't mad that they made a mistake and that they spilt that on the floor. I was really just tired. I had a long day at work. And I took that out on them. So then I will go back and I'll be like, hey, depending on which one it is, um, if, it, if it's my oldest, I'm going to use bigger emotional vocabulary. You know, that that's really important. But, you know, I was, I, I know you made a mistake. And when you make a mistake, you spill something, I would appreciate if you would clean it up, but I shouldn't have yelled at you. That really wasn't about you. I was frustrated about this, you know, something that happened at school, and I'm sorry that I took that out on you. So just being willing to just own your mistake yeah. and then apologize for it, um, that, that is going to be a pattern that you're going to want for your kids, that we talk to kids about, is like when you make a mistake and you're going to, yeah. we expect you to. Own it and then know how to make amends or rest, restitution for that relationship. Absolutely. And I love that whenever you were talking about that, it wasn't just apologizing and saying like, hey, I shouldn't have lost my temper, like that wasn't okay to do. I love that you actually took the time then to reference back to what was actually happening. Mm -hmm. Because again, our kids are gonna learn how to interact with their emotions and to understand that sometimes the emotion that you see in the moment is not directly connected to the moment. It's actually connected to a moment that happened two days ago or that happened a couple hours ago or that has been simmering in the background for the past month, like who knows, but whenever you take the time to connect those dots for your kids, then that allows them to think of it that way too, so that whenever they're in that situation, it allows them to kind of be able to do that. So you had talked about like walking away, and that's like one of those like common um, kind of like pause moments that you can do, and then we talked a little bit like coping mechanisms. That mm -hmm. kind of feels kind of sometimes like a big mm -hmm fancy word. What do you mean whenever you're talking about coping mechanisms? So whenever I work with students to help them identify, basically I just say, what do you like to do? Like, what is your favorite thing? Do you like to read? I'll give them examples. Do you like to draw? Do you like to listen to music? Um, and they'll be like, well, I really like to go outside and play with my dog. And I'm like, perfect, that's a coping skill. Put that down. And I'll have them make a list of just the things, the basic things that, again, I always say it can't harm your body in some way, um, that you enjoy to do and play with those. Like, see which ones make you feel the best so that then when you're having a moment, you know that you've got this list and be like, okay, I'm going to go spend five minutes walking outside, just enjoying the fresh air or swinging in the swing or petting my dog. Um, playing with those things helps you get an idea of, depending on what you're dealing with, um, what coping skill do I need to use today? And I love that because they really are simple things. Again, I think that sometimes we um, have a tendency to overcomplicate, you know, like just mental health and how to deal with it or how to talk about it. And it really is as simple as being able to go, you mentioned animals. Um, I have dogs and for me, like going and just like cuddling my puppy is one of the quickest ways to get me to calm down. Like it's just something that works automatically, but mm -hmm. I wouldn't have necessarily thought like, oh, that can count. Like that's something that could work as well. Mm -hmm. So I think that that is really helpful. Now, so this weekend, I already confessed to everybody. They all now know that I'm a very flawed human being um, and got upset with my kids. And we had had a kind of practice, you know, together where we did this conversation a little bit beforehand. So this was all fresh on my brain. And I was sitting there, I was so frustrated and so mad at that moment. And I remember thinking to myself, I was like, okay, 
this is whenever I'm supposed to break out a coping skill because that is what Chelsea and I just got finished talking about. And I literally like felt myself being like, but I don't want to because I'm really mad. So how do you get past that initial first? Because sometimes it does feel hard mm -hmm. to be like, I'm going to go sing now. I'm going to go find a something, I'll go a nature hike. Look at me. I'm Maria from The Sound of Music. <laughs> like, you know, like that doesn't feel like an easy leap. So is there something we can do to kind of bridge that gap? Yeah. So one of the things that I teach students how to do all the time is deep breathing. So, and that's a grounding technique. Um, there's other grounding techniques, but that's one of the ones that I always use with students because it, it can help with so many things. Whenever you take deep breaths in, it floods your brain with oxygen. So if you're feeling sleepy, that'll give you a boost. If you're feeling stressed or angry or just having a big emotion, it might be nerves, um, then that's going to help bring you back and give you a reset. It also helps with just reducing stress over time. So if you make time, I mean, I'm talking like if you took two minutes a day to do deep breathing and you did that every day, just like working out and lifting weights, it's building a muscle that helps bring you back to kind of an equilibrium. For, so yeah. that's definitely that. something that I do with kids and yes. teach them how to do. So um, I've been in therapy for a number of years, and so I know what deep breathing is because my counselor mm -hmm. taught that to me, but I know that it's something that people hear a lot, but don't necessarily always know exactly mm -hmm. what does it mean to do deep breathing. So would you be willing to teach us how to of do course. deep breathing? I think that yes. that's a very valuable <laughs> skill. So, okay, I'm going to so do it with you. So there's lots of different ways to do deep breathing. Okay. This is just the easiest one because it's a five and five. Um, and so it's, for me, it's easy to remember for kids whenever they're trying to do it on their own. So, and I will practice it with them and I give them, I'm like, you're going to feel so weird and it's okay. I'm not looking at you. In fact, I'll look at my phone while you do it if you want to. Yes. <laughs> um, and you can close your eyes, but um, put your feet flat on the ground. And then I will have them place their hand on their stomach because we're wanting them to breathe from their diaphragm. So I'll say, put it on your belly because whenever you start to take the breaths, you should feel your, you should feel expansion here. So your stomach should come out, not your chest. It shouldn't be shallow breath. Um, and so then I'll have them put their other hand on, on their chest and then I'll have them close their eyes and say, I'm gonna count to five and I want you to breathe in through your nose while I'm counting the first time. And then you're gonna blow out through your mouth for five. Okay. All right, you ready? Close my eyes. Close your eyes. Okay. okay. One, breathe in for one, two, three, four, five. Good. That's long. And out <laughs> for one, two, three, four, five. And that's exactly what they say every time. Yeah. But then we'll do it again. I'm like, okay, we're going to do it again. And then I'll set a timer and we'll usually do it for a minute or two. I love that. Just in like, the that is so easy to do. And that's something that you can do, like, in, like I could be in my car mm -hmm. and do that. I could probably be mm -hmm. on stage doing that. I and just I did. encourage them. I'm like, you don't need me to do this. You can do this in the classroom. Yeah. You can do this anytime. You can do this at home in your bed. So it is. It's, it's easy to do anywhere. I love that. And that is really, truly, like, a very simple, easy step that you can take that then gets you to being like, okay, I'm now calm enough to do my coping skill. And so now I can go into whatever else it is that I need. So that is definitely one. And I love that you brought up too that it is something that may at first feel uncomfortable, but truly if you develop the habit of it, it becomes so easy. It becomes like second nature to do. Mm -hmm. Like I will have times now where I get into something and I am just like, and I'm going to automatically just start deep breathing because I'm getting ready for it. And it's helpful, like you said, with a variety of motions, not just with like anger, but it also can help you if you are feeling anxious or nervous or sad or anything like that. I think that's awesome. So we've already been talking a little bit about some of the different coping skills, some of the things that we can do. Those are things we can do with our students as well. So what are some of the biggest issues that you're seeing um, that are arising these days with our students? Mm -hmm. So I've been a counselor for 14 years, and um, I kind of in my mind knew what I thought the biggest ones were, or the ones that I had experienced, but I also just looked at some stats, and um, anxiety and depression have increased in the past 10 years from 5.4% to 8.4%, and I've definitely felt that shift, um, especially with anxiety. Um, so that is, those are the two that, that I feel like I deal with the most. Um, and then also a third would be um, ADHD. Um, and so about 9.8% of students have a diagnosis of ADHD. And I think part of that shift is that we're getting more diagnoses with that because we're better educated about the different ways that ADHD can look in students. Um, so you may have your inattentive type, you may have your hyperactive type, or you may have a combined. And um, 
that I love students that have ADHD because they have the they have the most I don't know the interesting brains. Their brains just work a little different. So um, those are that is a challenge, but it also is something that I try to make them see that it also gives them a, a unique set of strengths. Absolutely. And I think that it's also worth noting, too, that generally speaking, like these things can all kind of um, cluster together a mm -hmm. lot of times. Um, until I actually experienced depression, I did not know that if you leave anxiety untreated long enough, then it actually will lead to depression. Like that is what eventually happens to your body is that it's no longer able to handle it or to process it. And so it responds by leaning into depression. And similarly, um, people who have ADHD, they are more more prone toward anxiety and more prone toward depression. And so again, that's just something that you want to make sure that you're equipping them for and that mm -hmm. you're helping them with some of the things that we're kind of talking about even now. Mm -hmm. Like that is very, very helpful. So what are some of the things that we can do just as parents, grandparents, as grown-ups that are involved in our kids' lives to help them to maintain their mental health? So kids thrive off of routine. Um, and I would say as part of that routine, just making sure that you're building in some, some family time, like that, that they can know that that's a time where you guys are going to connect. It would be a really good opportunity to do an emotional check-in with your kid. Um, and then also just setting boundaries for them, boundaries with technology, with social media, um, setting bedtimes, things like that, things that are just very basic needs, but that ultimately set them up to have positive mental health. Now that feels a little bit counterintuitive to me, just because I know whenever I set um, hard boundaries with my kids or whenever I enforce um, restrictions, like whether it be with technology or bedtimes or things like that, they don't seem very happy about it. Mm -hmm. So it seems very counterintuitive that I need to make them unhappy to help them be happy, mm -hmm. right? But that's yep. actually true because at the end of the day, even though our kids may push back on those things, they may be angry with you in that moment, they actually are appreciative mm -hmm. of knowing what the boundaries are are, of knowing the framework in which they are supposed to operate inside of. So it's kind of almost one of those like short-term pain but long-term game mm -hmm. um, that really, really is important and reduces anxiety levels mm -hmm. as yes. well by having those firm boundaries that like makes a really big difference. Um, another thing that I think that you mentioned too was just a conversation, like having a conversation with your kid regularly, doing a check-in, mm -hmm. I think is what you usually call it. So what is a check-in? What does that look like? And how do you use it with your kids? Um, so a check-in is just where, so if I have a student come in, if I'm doing it in the school counselor role, I have a little sheet and I'm going to ask them, I'm like, what is your mood? And they, if it's a younger kid, I've got smiley pictures. But if it's an older kid, I'm going to say on a scale of 10, you know, tell me where you're at today with your mood. Tell me where you're at with your friendships. Tell me where you're at with your schoolwork. Um, if it's at home for, for my kids, I'm going to ask them and say, where's your heart today? Um, and I've had that conversation, and I've set it up for them to go, when I'm asking you that question, I want to know, do you have some ugly stuff right around in your heart? Is there something we need to talk about? Are your relationships okay? So I kind of defined that for them and then set that up to know to expect me to ask them that question. Um, but it really doesn't have to be complicated. It doesn't have to be a long conversation. In fact, I probably wouldn't make it a long conversation. Just a, how are you doing today? Where are you at? And, and make it a part of your regular everything so that when they are having a moment where you're kind of having that feeling as a parent, like some don't feel right, mm -hmm. something's going on, then they're already used to that. And hopefully we'll, we'll open up and give you a little glimpse into what's yeah. going on. Well, and I love that because something that we try to talk about a lot, even here, like with parents and stuff, is just that you never want for a conversation to be a one-time conversation. Mm -hmm. Whether you're talking about faith, whether you are talking about bodies, puberty, mm -hmm. development, like whatever the topic is, it's so much better if you can be having constant ongoing conversations as opposed to a single moment conversation, significantly more impactful. So when you say regular, what do you mean? What is regularly? Once a week? Once a month? Once like it could what? be once a week. I okay. was gonna say that's a that would be a good thing to shoot for. I think once a week, but it, it, at a regular interval. I mean, once a month. I would, I would do it more, maybe every two weeks at the yeah. most. But, but just something that they are expecting it to happen, expecting you to ask, mm -hmm. um, and that it makes it then not uncomfortable. The other thing that I would say along these same lines is that having, or it made me think of this, is just having other adults mm -hmm. in your child's life. Um, because while if you're putting in that work and doing those check-ins, there comes a point 
particularly when they start to hit adolescence, where the chances are going to be that they're not going to open up to you first. They're probably going to open up to another adult first if there's, those adults are there, or it's going to be their peers. Um, there's that too. But you want to have intentionally tried to put adults that you trust and that you know love your kids in their life because while it might hurt your feelings, I know it does mine sometimes, that you're not the first person that they share all the things with. Just knowing that there's other adults looking out or that you can talk to about what's going on with your kid, that's going to help you as a parent with your own mental health just to have that release. But it's also going to just make sure that your kid is safe and healthy and that that adult's going to come to you if there's something that needs to happen from that point. Absolutely. And, you know, one of the things research has shown um, that children or students who have at least three additional adults in their life outside of their grown-ups, so outside of their parents, if they have three additional adults that they are in a significantly lower risk for experiencing things like anxiety, depression, and a whole host of additional health concerns. So intentionally building those relationships into your child's life is not only going to have them have better mental health, but it actually is going to give them even better physical health as well. And that is one of the things that we work really, really hard in family ministry to try to help you with because we have small group leaders that are working with your child. It actually starts all the way in preschool and extends all the way through high school. Um, and they are there working with your student, forming a relationship with them because we want to be some of those additional adults that are inside your child's life so that whenever they have a tough topic that they don't feel comfortable maybe going to mom or dad with, they do have that other person. Mm -hmm. But Obviously, we can't partner with you if you aren't going to partner back. Like, you know, we can't show up at your house with a small group leader and be like, here, they need to spend time with this person. Like, we need you to get them into a contact with that person so that we can form that relationship and truly create something better. And having had um, kids that have had small group leaders, now that I've got a middle schooler and I've got one that's about to be going into fifth grade, I have seen how impactful those small group leaders have been in my kid's life. They absolutely do tell them things um, that they haven't told me, or sometimes they tell them things that they have told me, but then they'll come back and be like, well, mom, okay, so Miss Tiffany actually said the same thing, so I think you might have been right about that. And I'm like, yes, that's exactly what I want to hear. Mom is right. That is a win. I am winning at life. So those relationships really are important, um, and they are very much impactful, mm -hmm. I feel like, in our yeah. kids' lives. And I would say in the schools, whenever Absolutely. we were talking to the kids starting in the sixth grade, we do a unit called Positive, like Good Mental Health is for Everyone. One of the things we have them do is identify three adults in their life so that they have them and we will make them physically write them down. Who is someone at home you can talk to? Who is someone in the community? Um, who is someone at school you can talk to if there's something going on that you need help with? So I love it. I really do. Okay, so let's say that you're doing these check-ins regularly with your students, so you're trying to help them to maintain that positive um, kind of, you know, mental health and everything, and you start to notice a few things. What are the signs or what are the things that we should be looking for that really cause us to pay attention a little bit more closely to know if our student is truly struggling or if they're just, you know, being a teenager. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's gonna, all going to fall under that umbrella of changes in behavior, um, changes in appetite, changes in just their overall mood, um, changes in are they not spending time with their friends anymore? Are they not doing things that they typically enjoyed? And is this happening over a period of time? So generally we say over a period of three weeks. Like is it getting worse over those those periods of three weeks. Um, and if that's the case, then it may be time to step in and have a conversation or seek some support um, from a, a mental health resource. Absolutely. So something that I have heard you say many times is that it is much better to be proactive mm -hmm. with this stuff than it is to be reactive. So if you're starting to have some feelings and you're just noting, noticing things, whether you can put your finger on it super well yet or not, it is still better to go ahead and start initiating mm -hmm. some of those conversations and trying to figure that out. And then what are some of maybe the like support options that might be available to parents whenever it comes to trying to help both identify if their student is struggling and then if they do see that yes they are yeah so this is where I would put a plug for school counselors um, 
we have amazing school counselors in Callaway and in Murray Independent, and that would be a good starting place. That is exactly what they are there to do. They wear lots of hats, but this is one of them, and one of them that they're very passionate about. Um, I love when parents call me and just kind of want to have conversations about, this is what I'm seeing out of my kid. Is this okay? Um, do you know, is, should I be concerned? And they are just a really good starting point because they, while they don't do long-term counseling, they will check in with your child over a few over a few weeks. And then if there continues to be some red flags, because they're going to look at them and see the academic side of it, and you've already told them how you're feeling about things you're seeing at home, um, and then they're talking to your kid one-on-one, on one checking in about these things, then they can then connect you to outside resources in the community should you as a family decide that that's the best next step. So that would be just like a really good starting place. Mm -hmm. And I love that because I don't know if y'all ever have this struggle, but I have a tendency to be like, I don't want to bother them. Like I know they have so much on their plate and they're, they're doing so much more stuff and I just don't want to be a burden to them and it's probably nothing, it's not a big deal. But realistically, that's what you guys would mm -hmm. actually appreciate us doing because you would love to have students that are going to be able to cope well and to be healthy and to be happy and to do all those things. So it's not a bother. We're not, we're not intruding on you Absolutely. if we choose to take not advantage of that. Absolutely. Okay, so um, what would you say, this is kind of our last like wrap-up question here, what would you say to parents, grandparents, adults, like all the people in the room, and they have a lot of concerns about their child's mental health and what they are facing, what they're struggling with, what would you say to encourage them today? More than anything, I want them to know that it is not their fault. They didn't do anything wrong. There are so many things that can cause mental health challenges. And the fact that you are concerned um, means the most to me as a school counselor. When I get to have those conversations, I'm like, thank you for trusting me. Thank you for advocating for your child and, and letting us try to get them the support that they need. So just know that it's okay to not be okay. It's okay for your child to not be okay. And that reaching out for help is really a sign of strength. And please don't feel like it's a weakness in any way. No, I love that because I do think that it is um, kind of tempting for all of us to sort of want to pretend like that side isn't existing, you know, that we want to, again, to try to be perfect whenever realistically, like the thing that we can give our kids and ourselves is whenever we choose to be real and to be open, to be honest with those things. Um, I once, I remember I used to have a conversation whenever my kids were little, like all the time. And I would just be like, I just don't know if I'm a good mom. I just don't know if I'm a good mom. Am I doing enough? Am I doing too much? Am I like, what am I doing? And I remember a very wise lady looked at me and she said, the fact that you're asking that question means that you're a great mom. So you can feel confident in what it is that you are doing simply because you know that you are caring and that caring is that first step. So even though you may not know what to do after that, there are people around you that want to help you, that want to be there for you. Um, and that is something Matt has talked about a lot over the course of this entire series is this idea of like, you're not alone. Like we wanna be here for you, we wanna partner with you in family ministry, we would love to partner with you as a parent, um, but also like in our small groups and in our serving groups and in all of those different areas, you don't have to try to figure this out by yourself. Like this is something that we can do together and we can make it better together. So I love it. I think that was incredibly helpful, Chelsea. Thank you so much for everything. I'm so glad that you were here today and that we Thank got to you. have this conversation. Um, I know we didn't get to obviously tackle by any means all the things, but hopefully that gives you a great starting point and you guys are going to be able to take that and start putting into practice um, a couple of the things that we talked about this week. So today I want to end with just taking a moment to pray. Um, and to recognize the role that God can play in helping us to both have good mental health for ourselves, but also for others. So if you guys will, let's pray together. Hey, God, thank you so much for just all of the mothers that are in this room and for all of the women who have chosen to impact and influence a child's life, whether they are their mother or their teacher or a coach or a small group leader, whatever their role might be. Um, because the reality is, God, that you have given us an enormous array of emotions to experience and to figure out, and you have not left us alone with those things. And instead, we truly can turn to you, but we also can turn to each other and to be able to help each other. 
um, and if necessary, seek out medical help and to be able to fight those things together. So we are grateful for all the opportunities that you have given us, God, and we just ask that you will give us wisdom and willingness to actually show others whenever we are needing help and whenever we are needing assistance, um, just so we can continue to be the best parent for our children as possible. We love you and it's in your name that we pray, amen.